Welcome to a Legendarium special about the history behind Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray, published in 1890. Born on October 16, 1854, to an aristocratic family in Dublin, Oscar Wilde came from a literary tradition. His mother claimed descent from Dante Alighieri, the author of the Divine Comedy, and wrote about the Irish potato famine and its aftermath for British newspapers. Wilde had a little sister named Isola, whom he adored. Young Isola tragically died in 1867, and Wilde never fully recovered from the loss. He carried a lock of her hair sealed in an envelope with him until the day he died. Oscar Wilde had to keep his homosexuality a secret, for it was a crime in Victorian Britain. He married Constance Lloyd in 1884 at the age of 30. He had two sons with her, but he secretly wanted a daughter, and sometimes he dressed one of his sons in gowns. During this time in his life, Wilde busied himself by editing a ladies' magazine and by writing plays for the stage. The most famous of these became The Importance of Being Earnest. Most of these plays centered on mocking what Wilde saw as the shallowness of middle and upper class morality. At dinner parties, he amused guests by telling fairy stories that often centered on martyrdom and forbidden love. Oscar Wilde followed the aesthetic movement, which valued art for art's sake. Older authors, like Charles Dickens and Victor Hugo, wished to use art to bring attention to social evils. Others, like the Brothers Grimm, used it to teach good morals to their readers. Aestheticists believed that life should be lived in the spirit of art, and beautiful things made for their own sake. This idea flourished in reaction to the materialism of Britain's middle class, which showed their status through fine houses and consumer goods, which they also believed showed good taste and character. On the other hand, aestheticists like Wilde saw the middle class, which ironically made up their audience, as unrefined bores who thrived amid shameful class inequality, social hypocrisy, and complacency. Seemingly fearless of what others thought, Oscar Wilde resolved to live a life of beauty and to mold his life into a living work of art. Arguably, he did just that with his only novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, by far Oscar Wilde's best-known work, though he also wrote short stories, poems, and essays. Wilde took some influence from Gothic fiction, popular in the early 19th century, which focused on romance, horror, and cruelty. One of the most famous examples of Gothic literature is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Along with the supernatural painting, Wilde gave his evil hero Dorian Gray a truly gothic backstory. Dorian's mother, a noblewoman, eloped with a poor soldier. The woman's father, a villainous old lord, had his daughter's husband murdered before Dorian's birth. The grieving young widow died soon thereafter, leaving Dorian to be raised by the loveless tyrant. It is also worth noting that many see the influence of the tale of Faust in the story of Dorian Gray. Faust, of course, tells the story of a scholar who sells his soul to the devil in exchange for knowledge and power, though Dorian Gray sought something different. In the novel, Dorian Gray is a stunningly handsome young man whose portrait is painted by the artist Basil Hallward. When Dorian is introduced to the cynical and hedonistic Lord Henry Wotton, he becomes seduced by Wotton's hedonism and begins to dive headfirst into a life of debauchery. Lord Ronald Gower, a Scottish sculptor and writer widely known to be a homosexual, likely inspired the character of Lord Henry. Wilde and Gower also shared a passion for asceticism. After Lord Henry warns Dorian that his looks will fade, Dorian wishes that the portrait would age rather than himself. Unlike Faust, Dorian makes no direct supernatural bargain, just expresses his willingness to make the trade. 
However, after Dorian causes the suicide of a young actress, Dorian sees the expression of his painted face change. A terrified Dorian then locks away the portrait of himself in his attic. In the middle of the story, Dorian Gray reads an unnamed French novel simply called The Yellow Book that is said to further corrupt him. Dorian becomes so obsessed with this book that he orders 12 copies of it, each in a different color to suit his mood. Wilde revealed that he based this book on Al Rebour, or Against Nature. He called the book one of the best I have ever read. Eighteen years pass in the novel, and Dorian remains young and beautiful, but he is trailed by rumors that he indulges in dark and sordid behavior. Basil Hallward, who remains devoted to Dorian, asks him about the rumors eighteen years later. He notes that Dorian's friendship seems to destroy men. One boy Dorian knew committed suicide, and others had their careers and reputations ruined. Dorian then shows Hallward the painting. The artist is horrified, filled with remorse, and begs Dorian to pray with him. Instead, the enraged Dorian stabs Basil Hallward to death. Dorian then blackmails an old friend named Alan Campbell into destroying Basil's body with chemicals. Afterwards, Dorian finds that one of the hands on the painting is dripping with red as if the canvas sweat blood. Later, Alan commits suicide, unable to live with the shame of what he did. Growing exhausted, Dorian tries to reform by passing up the chance to seduce an innkeeper's daughter. Unfortunately, he did not do this out of a genuine desire to reform, but simply to make some small sacrifice to, in the hopes that it would wipe away a lifetime devoted to evil. When Dorian sees the portrait does not change, a furious Dorian tries to destroy it, but when he stabs it with the knife he used to kill Basil Hallward, Dorian himself dies, becoming old and hideous while the portrait returns to its youthful state. Wilde's editor cut 500 words from the novel before its first publication in Lippincott's monthly magazine, because the content related to intimate relations, including those between men, which no Victorian publisher would have put to the public. Even so, most of the relationships between the three main characters are decidedly homoerotic. Lord Henry is described as performing an intellectual seduction of Dorian, and Hallward is openly obsessed with Dorian's beauty. For its supernatural overtones, its refusal to please the public, and portrayal of homoerotic culture, the book faced harsh criticism and sold only a few copies. Many considered the novel to be actively harmful. One critic called it a poisonous book, the atmosphere of which is heavy with the odors of moral and spiritual rot. Oscar Wilde himself said that he wrote the book only to please himself and did not care what the public thought. For a time, the Wilde family could not appear in public because of the uproar. In 1891, Wilde revised his novel to include six more chapters and a preface in which he defined the aesthetic movement in art and literature. He said that books should be seen for their beauty and emotional impact, not any moral lessons they taught. Yet it is striking that most Orthodox Christians would agree with the ultimate lesson of this extremely aesthetic novel, namely that unrepentant sinners are doomed to destruction. Wilde gave a copy of the picture of Dorian Gray to his friend Lionel Johnson, who lent it to his 20-year-old cousin, Lord Alfred Douglas. Lord Douglas became so absorbed in the novel that he read it 14 times before being introduced to Wilde. Captivated by Lord Douglas's beauty, Wilde offered to tutor him for his university exams, but the two wound up becoming lovers. Alfred's father, John Douglas, the ninth Marquess of Queensbury, found out about the affair. He sent Wilde a calling card at the private Albemarle Club in London that exposed Wilde's secret. This badly damaged Wilde's reputation and led to the author's trial for homosexuality. The court sentenced Wilde to two years of hard labor for gross indecency in 1895. Tragically, Oscar Wilde died only five years after being sentenced to prison, for he contracted an infection while imprisoned. 
Reading Jail, where Wilde served his sentence, would later be transformed into an art museum, something that surely would have pleased Oscar Wilde. Perhaps it is his ultimate victory. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.